the interventions and interactions that Sati Pasala has been having with schools here in Sri Lanka and also uh, very summarily uh, about how uh, mindfulness has been helping with students uh, around the world through various speakers yesterday. Our next session, which is our first panel discussion, will be dealing with the future of education, mindful classrooms and mindful universities. But before that.
that was just a little interlude about what we should be remembering for our next panel discussion. I would like to invite first our moderator up on stage, uh, Mr. Deepal Suryarachi, and the panelists and speakers also at the same time, Dr. Chandrika Jayatilaka, Dr. Yasa Svivalpita, Venerable Ma Vajira, and Professor Aloka Patirana. Each of our speakers gets a total of 12 minutes each, and the balance of this one and a half hours will be for Q&A discussion. We will also be opening up the uh, Q&A discussion to the audience. There will be mics, roaming mics as well. Our guest speaker for this session uh, was due to be the Honorable State Minister of Education, Mr. S. Radhakrishnan, who has sent a message due to unavoidable circumstances, and his secretary, uh, Mr. Muttaya Dureswami will do the honors and sit on the panel as well. Mr. Dureswami. Vandaniya Vut, Poojaniya Vut, Gauraniya Swamil Nansalaginut, Mema Agana Vedasatahanata, Samprati Visitina, Sielu Bhavatunta, Subhudasana Pevaima Pratana Karna, Utami. In the Arumayana, Vilipunaru Nihal Chikhe, Varahetandirikum, Ungal Anevarayam, Kali Bandana Kuri Ungal Anebarakum in Manakati Chilatikin Rain. Good morning, everybody. First and foremost, I must thank the entire team of Sati Pasala Foundation for giving me an opportunity to pass it, participate in this program. The topic is given to my Honorable State Minister V.S. Radhakrishnan. Importance of mindfulness in plantation sector schools. The Honorable State Minister of Education was indeed very glad to have been invited as a special invitee and guest speaker to share a few words on the importance of mindfulness in plantation sector schools. However, owing to a sudden and urgent need, the Honorable State Minister had to go overseas and he requested me to represent him on this occasion. I feel honored to represent the Honorable State Minister here and take great pressure in reading out his message to you all. Before going further, first of all, we should understand what is mindfulness. In common language, it is being aware of something. But in psychology, it is a technique. The mindfulness is a form of meditation. Meditation is a simple, and cost-free way to help calm an unquiet brain. We can also define mindfulness as thinking quietly about what is going on in the present. We should not think about the past or the future. What we must think is only 
about our own breathing and what sense around us. Mindfulness is a good medicine to overcome the state of depression. I think today the number of people suffering from depression and anxiety has risen to nearly 75%. This is a serious contemporary issue in the society. At this point, if we look at the plantation community, it has been striving for a decent life for the past several decades with painful experiences. We should not think that the plantation area is there only for economic and commercial purposes. The responsibility of the plantation management companies does not end with just offering employment to the workers. They are also responsible for providing housing, water, gardens, welfare, temple, cemetery, and many other facilities that affect the daily lives of workers. Furthermore, most of you know that the plantation system is with rigid hierarchy, and the organizational structure is divided into five sections. The owner, the management, staff, sub-staff, and workers. The management consists of a manager, assistant manager, clerical, and white-collar workers constitute staff, while supervisors, drivers, mechanics, and crash attendants constitute the sub-staff. The plantation's social structure consists of management, staff, and labor. The three social categories found in the hierarchical occupational structure can be distinguished by four main characteristics. Firstly, they live segregated under different housing conditions known as line rooms in which no adequate living facilities. Secondly, in terms of income and economic conditions, which is not satis uh, sufficient to continue with decent life. Thirdly, the management and staff are monthly paid, whilst the labor is daily paid, is considered to be a discrimination. And fourthly, Management is somewhat fully may leads to patriarchal orientation. In the recent time, another phenomenon is noted that plantation worker, family mothers migrate into urban areas and Middle East countries in search of jobs with better salaries because of that their sons and daughters are being looked after by fathers or elderly grandparents or relatives. This is a pathetic situation regarding their kids and young adults. Further, you all know that still the complaint is valid on these people that they have nothing to do after a hard day's labor, and the only form of recreation is the consumption of alcohol. It is high time to think on school-going children and teachers of this nature. Students are mostly coming from in the pressurized family backgrounds, and the school climate is, seems to be put them into exams centered education process. Certainly, this creates vulnerable situation not only for students but for teachers. How we could overcome such situation in the future? That's the question. Student and teacher counseling measures are not properly in place in such schools. Therefore, I very much appreciate programs like Sati Parsala to be implemented in plantation sector schools. 
According to our knowledge, so far, no one has started this type of programs in the plantation sector schools other than the Sati Pasala Foundation. If this program is successfully implemented, we believe that the plantation communities, students will benefit immensely. Also, welcome our more innovative programs to uplift the standard of living in plantation sector in terms of poverty elevation, enhancement of education facilities, healthcare, and employment opportunities. I would emphasize the need to address the following. Mindfulness for improving students' academic and behavioral welfare. Mindfulness to prevent child abuse relating to physical, emotional, and sexual. Mindfulness for protecting children from drugs, alcohols, and tobacco. Mindfulness as a durable solution for ethnic religious harmony. We all know the Satipasala Foundation is making tremendous effort to implement those among school children in the island. But according to Dr. Dr. Tara Dimel, I have a major role to organize several workshops in implementing those to the children in plantation schools. To implement those among the plantation sector school children, the Sati Pasala Foundation could stretch her hands in organizing seminars, workshops in plantation sector schools where I will give my fullest cooperation to the foundation. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, venerable members of the Sangha, members of the clergy, and uh, dear friends. Uh, how this panel discussion will move forward, uh, each member will uh, make a short speech of 12 minutes, and then uh, we will uh, have a few minutes for a few questions. And uh, there will be a few mics uh, around the hall to uh, ask your questions and uh, please make them very brief and uh, if you signal our helpers will bring the mics to you. So we will start uh, this series of presentations starting from uh, Venerable Ma Wajira. I will not be introducing them because uh, the profiles are given in the uh, handbook. Yeah. You want her to start? All ah, right, okay. We'll get Dr. Chandrika to uh, speak uh, first. You may want to go there and uh, speak. Searching, roaming, forever seeking, wavering no more, the truth is beaming. Venerable monks, bhikkhunis, revered clergy, other dignitaries, distinguished guests, and mindful friends, I'm going to take you through the journey of Satipasala International, from the very first center in Melbourne to the multiple centers that have blossomed across the globe. Let's see how the journey started.
of four segments in the basic model used in Satipasana. The first is segment is on understanding mindfulness. The next is the practice segment, which is followed by a mindful game or activity. And the final segment is on reporting experiences and getting feedback. This, uh, the model is flexible and can be adapted to any local uh, conditions or resources. Let's look at a case study. In Melbourne, we have a, the, this model is fully implemented. This diagram summarizes the process of planning, implementing, and um, reporting of monthly two-hour sessions. <coughs> Sample topics considered for the first segment there, that um, on understanding mindfulness, are listed in these two slides starting with introductory topics such as the nature of the untrained mind, being a neutral observer, and moving on to topics on mindfulness in daily activities and how mindfulness helps us to overcome emotions such as anger and anxiety. The topics also include how a mindful mind could help us, especially in developing understanding about ourselves and others, which means it's leading to harmony in the family and in society, and also how it helps us to develop wisdom and, and, and true happiness here and now. We have uh, been operating this model for about 16 months, and then we wanted to test its success by seeking feedback from the Satipasala children and their parents. Okay. As you can see from these graphics, uh, about 78% of children that stated that they have practiced, they are practicing mindfulness even outside the Satipasala session. Now this result is based on a total of 72 children in the age group of 6 to 15 years of age. So it's a remarkable outcome. We also looked at the responses from the children who have attended eight or more sessions, which we consider as the regular participants. And if you can see the results we found. At home, children have become better communicators. At school, they pay more attention and receive positive feedback from the teachers. In social situations, practicing mindfulness has helped in creating better human beings. And uh, the next graph will show you. That there is more self-awareness among children. This is the summary of the improvements observed in Satipasala children by both the children and their parents. They achieve higher grades. They are less anxious about the future and make friends more easily. And as you can see, the list goes on. The results highlight the effectiveness of Satipasala. However, no journey is easy. Each step presents the international centers with a unique set of challenges. Let's look at some of the commonly placed, faced challenges. International censors are, sessions are normally held on weekends, which means children and their parents are involved in sports and other activities. 
It poses both participants as well as organizers of the Tati Basala sessions a challenge. And it is also a challenging, it is also challenging to find adequate venues and sufficient volunteers to facilitate especially large groups with children of varying ages and interest levels. Additionally, there is also increasing demand for more sessions more often. Small group sizes allow segments to be planned to suit the interest levels and dedication of participants. Challenge for the larger centers with frequent newcomers is to find the right balance to support all participants. There are various approaches under the broad banner of mindfulness. Children and volunteers may encounter some approaches which are different to that of Satipasala. So the challenge for Satipasala is to ensure the clarity of its approach and encourage participants to be consistent in their practice. I would like to suggest some potential solutions for overcoming these challenges. For example, to address the challenges faced by larger centers, subject matter experts can take responsibility for some aspects of the sessions. Experienced volunteers can help across different centers and divide large groups into more manageable, more focused subgroups. To build up the volunteer database, encourage clean practitioners with the mindfulness approach consistent with the Satipasala to become volunteers and ensure volunteers that they are appropriately trained to facilitate sessions. Engage with parents to raise their awareness so the value and the benefits of mindfulness practice, they will become aware of that and thereby they will encourage supportive home environments. They will provide supporting, supportive home environments. And of course the children, the Satipasala children can become ambassadors for mindfulness as their practice progresses. Now the way forward in terms of ensuring consistency. As the Satipasala continues to grow, ensuring consistency of the approach requires further development and clarification of its principles and the framework. Implementation of an agreed program structure with flexibility to adapt to local conditions and resources would ensure consistency across Satipasala centers. Using technology uh, to build a sharing platform to, um, so that lessons and the videos could be shared among the centers. Consistency is also ensured by continued development of standardized guidance, material, and mindful games bank. When forming partnerships with other mindful organizations, a formalized policy is needed, which will, in, which will allow you to evaluate the important aspects such as the differences in approaches used. For example, the difference between the Satipasala approach and the mind, business mindfulness. I would like to acknowledge our international colleagues who contributed by providing information and images. Also acknowledging the Satipasala group Melbourne for their input and support. Finally, let me share a glimpse of our journey with you.
Mindfulness is the way to true happiness. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jayatilaka, for that very uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, we, I would like now to invite uh, Dr. Yasa Sival Peter uh, to share her thoughts. Good morning, members of Honorable Clergy, ladies and gentlemen. My task today is to present the findings on a small impact assessment of Satipasala program, which was done among Sri Lankan school children on the invitation of Satipasala Foundation in the form of an external review. Before starting my presentation, I want to stress the fact that developing mindfulness to my understanding and you, the experts in mindfulness, would agree with me that uh, mindfulness developing sati is not aimed at achieving demonstrable or tangible objective outcomes as such, but it's rather uh, the development of uh, life as a whole, the wholesome development. But this objective assessment becomes important at times, especially in the light of uh, the necessity to introduce it into the certain national policies, and also when we want to upscale the program and include it into the national level agencies and institutions. To begin with, as it has been reiterated by the speakers last evening as well as today, why this program was aimed at children. Children are considered an asset to any country. It is the prime responsibility of the family, the community, and the policymakers as a whole to see that all children achieve their maximum potential in all avenues of life. Now, among, the, among all children, a remarkably challenging category is adolescents. They comprise about one-fifth of our population in Sri Lanka. And national surveys done among the adolescents in our country had shown some alarming levels of poor physical as well as mental well-being parameters, such as poor life skills, uh, substance abuse, and risky sexual behavior. Now, Satipasala Foundation, recognizing this national requirement, has partnered with Ministry of Education to introduce the mindfulness program to schooling adolescents in Sri Lanka. The program has been successfully conducted among a variety of schools island-wide, with the number of schools enrolled continuously increasing as you all are aware. Now, before embarking on our study, we had a look at the evidence of usefulness of practicing mindfulness around, uh, around the globe. Now, a thorough literature survey was done in this regard, and global and local evidence were revealed, and we found some few striking sources of evidence, which had shown the mindfulness programs to reduce the stress levels, enhance cognitive control, to improve the levels of empathy, PA acceptance, reduce stress levels, and uh, improve the executive functions such as working memory, cognitive flexibility, etc. So there was a lot of evidence. Thus, our assessment uh, started with the objective of finding out 
whether there is a significant difference in the selected attributes of mental well-being among children who practiced mindfulness through this program and those who did not at the same locations. So we did a cross-sectional comparative study in seven randomly selected schools where Satipasala program was conducted and a self-administered questionnaire was administered to students aged 11 years and above who participated in the program and in a comparative group who did not participate in the above schools. And we selected a few variables from the literature survey to be assessed in this study, including the levels of happiness, interaction with family, interaction with peers, perceived stress, life balance, concentration ability, self-esteem and capacity to recover, resilience. So the data analysis was done in a way in which the scores obtained in relation to each variable were categorized into two groups and the proportions were compared and the levels of significance was assessed with chi-square tests. Coming back to the results, we had the total of 715 students participating in this study, of which 361, around 50% were Satipasala members, and the other half were not. And in comparing the basic characteristics of the two groups, uh, age-wise, and when it comes to the gender balance, the two groups were more or less equal. Coming back to the variables that we assessed, to start off with the level of happiness. We uh, investigated it in two aspects, the self-rated happiness level, as well as the happiness level, a comparative happiness level in relation to the peers. But we were not able to find a significant difference between the two groups in this regard. Then coming back to the relationship with family where we assess their bonding with family, the trust and respect towards the family members. Here, we found a significant relationship, and the Satipasala members were significantly better in their bonding with the family and the trust and respect that they had for their family. However, this difference was not seen when we studied about the relationship with the peers there was no significant difference between the two groups. Coming back to the perceived stress levels, here we took an extra effort to assess their stress levels specific, with a tool specifically developed for children because the way the children and the adults perceive stress is quite different. So this tool was specifically um, developed to assess the stress levels in children and the perceived stress levels were significantly lower among the Satipasala members. That is the, the way the students perceived stress in their life. However, we could not elicit a significant difference in the ability to balance their education, extracurricular activities, and personal and family affairs between the two groups. Neither we could not elicit a significant difference uh, in the two groups in their attention and concentration spans. Self-esteem levels were also, uh, there was no significant difference between the two groups. However, their ability to recover from adversities in life and in the classroom environment as a whole had shown a significant difference between the two groups. That is, their ability to recover from adversities and their levels of resilience were significantly better among the Satipasala members. Our final task was to find out whether they are happy to continue with the Satipasala program. And the answer was yes, in 90% of the students. This reiterates the fact that I've mentioned at the very beginning, 
though we were not able to capture certain uh, advantages objectively, Satipasala program may have definitely done a change in the way they perceive life, the way they perceive their education setup. That is why amidst their busy schedules in education with the extracurricular activities, sports and everything, still they want to, wanted to continue with the program. And in conclusion, during the limited period that it was conducted, the Satipasal program has shown a significant improvement of its participants in the areas of maintaining healthy relationship with the family, managing stress, and recovering from adversities, that is the resilience aspect. However, there was no significant difference as for the study findings in the two groups in the levels of happiness, relationship with peers, and balancing life, levels of self-esteem, and the attention and concentration span. However, as I have mentioned in my study method, this was a cross-sectional comparative study where we studied the situation uh, at that particular moment. Therefore, the ideal would be to conduct a prospective cohort kind of a study where we can analyze the long-term effects as well as uh, the clinical trial kind of a comparative study where we control the conditions of the uh, study group as well as the control group so that we can uh, have some control on the frequency and the duration of, of the program that is being conducted. As Professor Saroj mentioned in the morning, the evidence is such that a 10-minute uh, uh, interval program of mindfulness every day, uh, it has been shown to improve the levels of, uh, say, the ability to face stress, as it has been uh, mentioned in the very recent Lancet uh, magazine. Uh, so uh, it is recommended that we do further research taking these facts into consideration. So I thank the Satipasala Foundation for inviting us to conduct this study. And my special thanks goes to Dr. Tara Dimel and also Jila and Mr. Gunasena in, in giving us the ideas to initiate this, and also Himashi and the team for assisting with data collection. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Walpeter, for sharing uh, a very interesting piece of uh, research information. This goes to show that uh, this Satipasala movement is not only building on uh, hunches, but we are using a lot of scientific methods to uh, support this initiative. I would now uh, like to invite uh, Venerable Ma Wajira to make her presentation, please. Good morning. Venerable Udama Jiwa, Sangha, respected members of the clergy audience, thank you for your attention. If anyone cannot hear me or understand me, please raise your hand. My topic today is mindfulness and its benefits for children in the context of the Buddhist culture course for children conducted at Pandita Rama Meditation Center in Rangoon, Burma. Historical background, a vision of building a good society. Siaro Upandita Biwamsa lived from 1921 until 2016. He was accomplished in both scriptural study and meditation practice. After having practiced meditation at Mahasi Sasanayeta, he devoted his life to promoting the teachings of the Buddha in accordance with the instructions of the late Most Venerable Mahasi Seado. He spoke about the institution of the Buddhist culture course as follows. 
Following World War II, people no longer had faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. They did not understand the benefits of keeping sila, morality, and thus they didn't keep the five precepts. Not keeping basic morality, they suffered the results of their own actions. People no longer knew their duties to each other in society. Thus, parents did not fulfill their duties to their children, to forbid them from doing what is wrong, point out what is good to do, provide an education, and so on. Children, in turn, did not know their duties to their parents, to take care of them, to help them, and so on. Teachers also failed in their duties towards their students. Sons and daughters thus did not turn out to be good. Because parents and teachers, for the most part, were failing in their duties to teach children, the Buddhist culture course for children was begun over 50 years ago. In the words of the present abbot, the objective is for children to understand the Buddha's teachings in a way that is in keeping with their age so that they become well-behaved, gentle, and civilized. They will be good people who will be able to keep from doing wrong physically, verbally, and mental, mentally. They will be able to, they, they, when they become adults, they will be like that. And they will be good people who are able to work for themselves, for the country, and for the teachings. They will be able to maintain and protect their culture and their religion. The Buddhist culture course is taught so that there will be future generations of good children without a break and so that the teachings will not disappear. If the teachings of the Buddha do not disappear in Myanmar, the people and the country will also not disappear. There are many supporting, there are many indications which support this concern to be seen in the present day world. With this objective, we take the time, effort, and money to hold the Buddhist culture course. And as in Sayadawji's words, to sum up, the children are taught those things are bad. They bring bad results. Knowing that something is wrong, one shouldn't fail in one's duty to avoid it. These things are good. Knowing what is good, one shouldn't fail in one's duty to undertake it. Not neglecting to avoid what should be avoided, not failing to do what should be done is apamada, to always live with mindfulness. As such, this is a very broad topic. Mindfulness should be taught in a way that is appropriate to the student. When teaching children, it should be taught from the basics. Teaching mindfulness without teaching the basics is like con constructing a building without any foundation. A building with a good foundation can last long. So too, children need to be taught from the basics if their situation is to be good. And in the Buddhist context, the basics are to understand the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Following that, children should be taught about morality together with, together with our duties to each other as human beings, the mutual duties of par parents and children, teachers and students, friends, husband and wife, bosses and workers, and monks and lay devotees. The Buddha described these six sets of relationship and their duties in the Sigalowada Sutta. Children don't automatically know what is right and what is wrong. They need to be taught. They can understand about good and bad deeds when these are explained in simple ways that they can understand, much in the same way parents need to explain to their children about food, which food is good for you, what food is bad for you. Food that is bad for you is not nutritious. Eating it can harm you and even make you sick, so you should avoid eating it. And this food is good for you. It is nutritious. If you eat it, you can digest it, feel good, become strong, be able to learn, and be able to do things. So you should eat food that is good for you because it will be beneficial. In the same way, there are things we shouldn't do because they are not good for us and bring us harm. Acts such as killing, stealing, adultery, lying, taking drugs and intoxicants are bad and, and should not be done. If one does them, these deeds bring bad results. We should refrain from doing them. There are things which we should do because they are good for us. They bring us benefit, sharing what we have with others, 
keeping morality, developing the mind is good for us. These things bring good results and we should do them. Knowing what is wrong, one shouldn't be afraid to refrain from wrongdoing. Knowing what is good to do, one shouldn't be afraid to do it. And this is also what is meant by apamada, to not be apart from mindfulness. Whether on a gross, medium, or subtle level, one should always know what one is doing. Benefits of the course from participants' points of view. When Sayadaoji was in Singapore, he met a young woman who had attended the Buddhist culture course as a child. He asked her, what good did it do, what good did it do you? She replied simply, I can control myself. And the meaning of this can be understood from the remarks of other participants. Self-control. Ma Kethi Mo said, attending the course made me able to live and associate with people in a way that is not low. It made me have self-control. In relation to work, personal interactions, and so on, when I encountered depressing things, the fundamental way of thinking and satipatthana give me the strength to live myself back up. They create a support for making my actions, speech, and thought free of fault and for not harming others. Because of the basic knowledge gained one month at a time at the Buddhist culture course, the good habits I cultivated, and the discipline I had had to follow, I can keep myself good without letting that decline. Learning to give up bad habits and live with metta and karuna. A seventh grader said, I used to talk back to my parents. I bullied younger children. If one of my friends dropped his pen, I would take it and not tell him. After studying at the course, I no longer lie to my parents nor talk back to them. I no longer bully younger ones. I no longer slander. I have compassion towards my friends. I feel badly to see my needy classmates. Now, my friends and family love me more than before, and I am happier. Before, I got 300 jots a day for pocket money. Now I get 1,000. I buy snacks with just half of that. The other half I give to the children who do not get pocket money or to the poor children. Seeing them happy, I am also happy. These are the benefits I gained. Mental control and consideration for others. An eighth grader said, I don't lose my temper as much as before, and I can keep my mind more peaceful. In the past, I did not consider whether my parents had money or not. I just asked them for whatever I wanted. Now, I don't talk back to them, get angry at my parents, or sulk. I understand them more. I feel ashamed of my bad past behavior. I try to be polite in body, speech, and mind. Knowing what is good, one should correct one's mistakes. And in this way, I want to be a good citizen who brings benefit to the country, a good Buddhist who supports the sasana. I am determined to become the, to the person I want to be. Benefits through a teacher's perspective. For the most part, children, young children, tend to develop faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and in Kama, cause and effect while older children tend more to develop a sense of their own ability to discipline themselves and the desire, having made themselves good, the desire to make their environment good. All in all, the students become able to de behave themselves in a disciplined way no matter where they go because they learned how to conduct themselves during the course. Sometimes uh, they don't develop sati intensively the way yogis do on retreat, but they learn to be aware of how their actions and speech affect others and how to keep from harming others. And although sometimes they go, up, go off the track, the teachers have enough influence that if the parents bring the students back to the teacher, the teachers can remind them how they behave during the course and they can pick it up again. In a secular setting, Sierogi used the analogy of riding a bicycle when explaining mindfulness to young people. It's like riding a bicycle without brakes to not have mindfulness. Youth is a time for gaining an education, but if there is not the restraint of mindfulness, one may be thinking about others, who looks good, who will be my friend, thinking about whether or not one matches up to others. If one si finds oneself lacking, one may become depressed. If one finds others lacking, one can be unkind. Going through life without mindfulness 
is like riding a bicycle without brakes. Accidents are sure to happen. Mindfulness gives a person for the, the space for evaluating before acting on something. Is this beneficial to do, to say, or plan? If it is beneficial, is it suitable to do or say or not? If one can evaluate in this way and choose what is both beneficial, suitable, and timely, one will succeed. The value of mindfulness. In Seattle's words, a person who always has mindfulness knows, I've made a mistake when he or she has erred. When correct, he or she knows that too. When in error, he or she corrects the mistake. When correct, he or she simply keeps on going straight ahead, like driving a car. If one can control oneself, then others are automatically protected because one does not do any harm. This is not just for the benefit of one's own physical, verbal, and mental behavior. To the extent one controls oneself, one no longer harms others. Both sides benefit. This brings peace to one's world. In conclusion, the Buddhist culture course for children is very beneficial for children and for the future. And this in turn benefits the sasana and all of us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Venerable Bajira. It was an interesting case study in a way supporting what uh, doctor was uh, uh, doing previously, uh, you know, how parents benefit and the story of getting bigger pocket money after practicing mindfulness. I think children will like that as it is. Finally, I would like to invite Professor Aloka Patirana to share his thoughts. morning, most venerable uh, uh, members of the clergy, ladies and gentlemen. My talk today is on mindfulness for undergraduates in the state university in Sri Lanka. So first of all, I would like to introduce to you the problems or the challenges faced by the universities of our country. Then what other countries have done to overcome these challenges for their students and the results. And finally, what sort of solutions we could provide for our students in the future to overcome the problems uh, that they face, particularly with regard to stress. So I'm starting with a case or a real true uh, student who is uh, an undergraduate of our university who came from Bakamoon, a remote village in the country, who lost his father at the age of 17 years, and he was a, made the sole breadwinner for the family. At the age of 17, he had looked after the mother and two younger sisters. And mind you, with all that stresses he managed, he didn't have money for tuition even, but managed to enter the University of Sri Javadanapura from Mahasen Madhya Mahavidyalaya Bakamuna. So imagine the stress he would have had. No money, no parents, and no social support whatsoever. I would not have survived. I would not have come to the university at all if I was in that situation. So this is the, uh, like a common scene which we see in our students in the local universities. So the lo local scenario, uh, students are really sheltered at home when they go to school, but when they get enter the university, they are at different educational status. Some people have come with a district uh, merit basis, some people with lower marks, so there's a very uh, disparity between the marks that they have when they enter, different social statuses, ethnicity is different, language they speak. Uh, we studied in Sinhalese for advanced level, but had to study in English for the universities, at the university financial issues, and they get exposed to different people of different religions from a school which has one religion. So it's a totally different scenario as soon as they enter the university. In addition to these stressors, there are barrier exams, politics in the universities, then staff which is not trained to handle students who are under stress. Ragging goes on, although people say that there's no ragging, still it goes on. Then there's a lot of peer pressure, and finally, not uh, last but the least, parental pressure who expect the students to do very well in the university. So a lot of stressors uh, are faced by these undergraduates in our universities. So let's see what the evidence is to uh, show this. Now this is the intake of students to our university of Sri Javadanapura in 2014-15. More than 50% of the students were receiving Mahapola scholarship. That means they were from a 
low socioeconomic background. Then more than almost 50% of the students were from outside Colombo. So they had to change their background. They had to find hostels to stay. But food was different. There are people whom they were associating were totally different. So they, there is a big problem for them. And this is a study done among uh, students of five universities in Sri Lanka, which shows that psychological distress is higher when compared to age match controls who are non-university students. Psychological distress up to about 40% compared to 26% of age matched controls. Then this is this same study shows the probable reasons for it. And out of the distressed students, most students or the rural uh, most uh, from rural areas, 65.4 percent, and and most of the students who were distressed were also in either university hostel or in rented rooms. So this contributed probably to their increased stress levels. So there is also studies to show that medical undergraduates are more vulnerable than their non-medical peers to deliver up depressive symptoms. So they have interviewed three, more than almost 400 uh, first-year students from difficult faculty, different faculties in the University of Rohuna, which showed that depression was more common among medical students when compared to non-medical peers, probably due to the uh, stressors of their studies. And this is one of the best studies which I came across. They had interviewed four, more than 4,000 students of the University of Colombo. And I was surprised personally to find out that the incidence of depression was 20%. That's one in five students in the University of Colombo have got depression. And out of that, 9% had major depressive disorders. So this is a fairly high percentage that we see in the local university setup. And what about the resources we have to handle this? Well, hardly any. And if you take the universities, there's only one medical officer for 12,000 students in the university. One medical officer who is not a trained psychologist nor a psychiatrist. And there's only one psychologist in our university for 12,000 students. There's only one trained psychologist who could handle their problems. And if you take the entire country, we have only 100 psychiatrists for a population of 20 million. So it's not surprising to find that there is a major issue if we try to handle this medically. And depressive illness is 20%. I told you major depression is 9%. Psychological distress is 40%. And added to that, there's a social stigma. People don't want to say that they have problem with regards to stress or that they are depressed. So therefore, I think preventive strategies are definitely going to be beneficial or helpful. Well, coming to the mindfulness programs for undergraduates done in other countries, they are very popular and done mostly for volunteers and they have been proven to be of value. This is one study, actually this is the first uh, program which was introduced to university students from the University of Monash in Australia, a pioneering university, one of the first uh, top 100 universities in the world. And they introduced mindfulness programs which to their uh, curriculum, and that was the first university to do, to do so, and found that introducing it to the curriculum improved the student well-being, particularly during their exam periods, which is the most stressful period for an undergraduate. So th there is proven benefit. Then there's another randomized controlled trial from universities among, uh, from college students in the USA. Again, meditation-based stress uh, management practices were proven to reduce stress and enhance forgiveness among college undergraduates. Then this is one of the most recent studies done at the University of Cambridge, probably the best university in the world. So they had a study which randomized 600 odd students to two groups. One group to have a mindfulness uh, practice uh, small group teaching sessions and to practice at home, which included uh, short eight minute meditations increasing to about half an hour of meditation at home and other mindful practice practice, including walking meditation and mindful eating, so which is very interesting. So what did they find? And this too was proven to uh, show, the, uh, prove that the students who practice mindfulness had lower distress scores even during exam times, so which is really very good. And, but remember that these are programs conducted on a long-term basis, not a short-term basis, and a lot of input was needed for these programs. So another study which show, show the same thing. So 
So what are the solutions we have for Sri Lanka? Well, two years ago, I think uh, Vinaba Damajiva wanted us to introduce this program to our university, and which was called Sati Sarasavia, based on the same uh, model as Sati Pasala. And our moderator today, Mr. Suraj, is also there at the inauguration uh, at this uh, meeting, which was attended by more than about 100 students, I think, which uh, was the, uh, like a pilot program to introduce mindfulness to the university students. And they had a half-day session with guided meditation, which was thoroughly appreciated. We got a feedback which uh, showed that they were really uh, happy attending that program. But unfortunately, the university's the students went on strike immediately afterwards, and we were close to almost one year. So we couldn't continue the program. Uh, but fortunately, I have the other coordinator of the new uh, mindfulness practice center here in the audience today, uh, Dr. Mahavidanage, who is, you can see him walking, doing walking meditation. He has now reintroduced the mindfulness practice to our university. This was the inaugural uh, program which we had in January, which was last month, attended mainly by the university academic staff, but uh, now he has started uh, uh, teaching mindfulness practice to undergraduates as well on a weekly basis. And I saw a recent email saying on a twice weekly basis, which I I'm sure it's going to help our undergraduates. So I think still we are having a voluntary participation. So when we have voluntary participation, and, uh, must, we must realize that people who really are probably mindful, who want to be more mindful are the ones that are really attending. Those who really need it might not come. So we have a problem. So if we are to continue, or improve this program, I think we have to maintain the secular nature because of the uh, multicultural or multi-ethnic uh, composition of our university students. And we need to have a tailored program and not to follow something which is done in other countries because we can't, uh, we don't have the resources to uh, like have those such programs in our country. And we might have to target the population. So we'll have to probably think of people who really need it uh, to get them to attend the program. And we also need dedicated facilities. Now, at the moment, we only have a small room which can house about 30 to 35 participants. We are in the process of uh, acquiring another building for it. But the most difficult part I see is to find my, uh, trainers for mindfulness, which, are, which is probably the most difficult component of this. Because we need people who can really do guided meditation and who are committed on a long-term basis and not for a short term. And uh, while the same thing, access to support from experienced teachers is vital. In summary, uh, ladies and gentlemen, stress-related issues in our universities is common, serious, and mostly unknown or underestimated and needs to be addressed. And we don't have the resources to address it with medical personnel. So mindfulness programs definitely, which have been proven to be beneficial, is going to be helpful for us as well. But it's a tough task. Resources are vital, and we need to finally again, stressing the point to maintain the secular nature of these programs to have it running smoothly in our universities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. You make us stressful, uh, <laughs> highlighting the real challenges uh, we are facing. Uh, we had an interesting array of presentations. Uh, uh, are there any burning questions out there so we can uh, allow you not to get very stressed uh, but ask the question now itself? Anybody? Otherwise, I'll have a few questions. Uh, can we have a mic here on the front row? Yeah. That's right. That's smart. Good morning. My name is Maria Lucia, and I have a question for Dr. Uh, Jayatiglaka. And it's related, uh, one of the things you mentioned was that uh, there are, uh, for facilitators, some of them have uh, different approaches. And you mentioned this as a, as, as a challenge in uh, doing the, the, the practice of Sati Pasala. And I want to know more if those approaches, how different those approaches are from the approach of Sati Pasala. And, and my question comes uh, because uh, 
from my uh, understanding, uh, it's important to integrate the approach of Sati Pasala into other uh, approaches. And because we are talking also about uh, working with different religions, different settings. And so I would like to understand what are the, those differences that make it difficult to maybe integrate into other approaches. And my second question is related to the participants. And um, I saw many pictures and I saw that most of the participants are uh, maybe Sri Lankan uh, children. So I'd like to know if you are also working in other countries with non-Sri Lankan children or non-Buddhist children, and if the efforts have been made, how does it work or how it has worked? Okay, thank you for your question, Maria. I would first um, answer the second question, which is, uh, yes, basically our children, the participants so far have been mainly Sri Lankan children, but we have had other children from other nationalities, and they sort of, but they are not a majority at the moment, but we are open for all nationalities, and we are a secular program run in English, and we welcome anyone from any background. But that is the idea of Venerable Mahatero also, to expand it to the wider community, and some centers actually have started doing that already. So the first question you had <coughs> about the approaches. Yes, Satipasala uses a method based on bare attention. So it is simply being a neutral observer. And we try to keep that approach consistent in our lessons. And we make it clear to our facilitators. That is the basic approach for Satipasala. But as one of the speakers before mentioned, there are different approaches where the emphasis may be getting profits or improving some performance specific targets other than just having bare attention and letting the mind to develop, to become clear, to develop wisdom. So that is the difference. But that's why we need consistent guidance material and to clarify the approach of Satipasala and the framework. With that, we will be able to proceed with the consistent approach. Is that clear enough? Thank you. Uh, let me add one more thing. Uh, my name is Vimal Vansa from US. To add uh, to explain what Maria's question is, actually, we re recently introduced a Satipasala program under the guidance of uh, Most Venerable Namaji to New Jersey. In that one, under the Samadhi Buddhist Foundation, we have certain number of non-Buddhist and non-Sri Lankan uh, students attending that. So actually, they are beginning to spread the word, and I'm sure that it is spread in other, other outside Sri Lankan setup. Now. Coming back to my question, actually, is to, it's very nice to hear that from the panel of the different aspects of Sati Pasala and indeed the Sati Sarasavya. Can you tell us, the audience, very briefly, what are the hindrances to progress of in each your setup of progressing well in the Sati Pasala program? That would be very helpful to everybody listening to this question. Okay, I can explain based on my experiences in Melbourne. <coughs> we have a large group of participants, about 100 children. So we have regular newcomers. So we have to cater, we have to actually support both the newcomers regularly as well as the regular attendance. So we are seeking ways to divide into subgroups and allocate uh, suitable part facilitators to conduct each subgroup in a more focused manner. So that has been a challenge. And also to find the adequate venues and the time slots, which will suit the families and the children, because we are not running in schools at the moment. It's just volunteer participation on weekends. So as you know, in Western countries on weekends, it's quite a busy schedule for families to find a time slot that suit everyone is also a challenge. So and the multiple approaches. Pe Children get exposed to different approaches through free media that you can't stop. So, but make sh making sure the consistency is another, another challenge. So is that something you're looking for? Yes, all right, thanks. Uh, I have a, can I talk, can I ask? Yeah, I do have rather a comment for Professor Aloka Patirana and a question uh, from, 
to Dr. Yasasui. The comment is, uh, this is regarding, it's very interesting uh, findings of yours, uh, Professor Aloka. Uh, this is, uh, so we are moving on to Sati uh, Sarasavya, which is very interesting, and I hope and wish it will be a productive one. Uh, I used, uh, I'm Dr. Menaka Lienage from the same university, University of Sri Jayavadanapura, working in the Department of Mathematics. I, I do have uh, this interest of mindfulness even I'm really re starting from my childhood. So I used to you know, take uh, uh, two, three minutes of my uh, lecture for the mindfulness of our students in the class. Uh, I can see that the uh, head of the uh, center is also here. Uh, so, so that, I mean, I'm just wondering whether we can start with that little thing in our classrooms. It's two hours of my lecture, two, three minutes wouldn't do much harm on that. And the feedback that I got from the students, they like it very much. Some of the students do come to the lecture, uh, particularly because of that, rather than uh, you know learning mathematics. That is one thing. Uh, the other question is to Dr. Yasasi. We expect, I, it's really surprising to see the, there's not much of a difference between the two groups for the happiness, peer relation, and uh, mainly the attention and the concentration. Do you mind uh, explaining that a bit to me? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, as I've explained uh, during the presentation also, uh, the study assessment we did was a cross-sectional comparative kind of a study. So, uh, and also, we have not controlled the conditions uh, under which the students underwent the Satipasala program. Uh, to explain further, like we did not have uh, any guidelines as such that these students underwent um, uh, the mindfulness program of this much of a frequency and for this uh, much of a length uh, in the duration, etc. So uh, maybe the time was not enough to show any any positive results. That could be one explanation uh, because usually uh, to develop. Uh, when it comes to the attention uh, span, etc., as Professor Sarush uh, explained in the morning, it would take a bit longer uh, for them to like uh, achieve such skills. And also, uh, maybe the uh, experts in mindfulness would agree with me. Now, we this for a set of students who are uh, interested in mindfulness as well as maybe there's another set who is not really into the program like though we introduce a program now we introduce it in schools mainly not only to the volunteers but to a grade as a whole i suppose i'm correct um, so uh, there may be a set of students who are not who have not really grasped the idea so uh, the results gets diluted among those who have grasped it, as well as those who have not grasped it. Because we just took a group who underwent, who followed the Satipasala program, irrespective of the fact that whether they have grasped the idea, whether they have practiced it very frequently, uh, and things like that. So uh, that may have affected the results. So as I mentioned at, like, uh, at the end of the presentation, we need further studies long term to elicit these benefits. The absence of a positive result in this study does not mean the absence of, of you know, such effects. OK, there is one more question from the gentleman at the very end. He uh, indicated uh, first. Yeah, My name is Alvin Saleh. Uh, this can be addressed by anyone on the panel. Shouldn't mindfulness start at home with the parents first? You know, I know you all are talking of children and all that, but without uh, you know, without a grounding, a home, good home background, uh, would, wouldn't that be the obvious place to start? Like Dr. Patreda said, I mean, you all had a program at the university and then your guys went on strike you know, after that, you know? So, uh, I mean, this is common, right? We see university students out on the roads all the time. So, shouldn't this be started at home? 
exactly. I, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer the question, but uh, I think mindfulness starts with one's own self. So it doesn't matter whether it's home, university, school, wherever. So if you train one's one to be mindful, you can practice mindfulness wherever you are. So the problem is to uh, find the target population. So school is probably one of the best places where you can target a receptive group to train mindfulness. So once they are mindful at school, they're definitely going to be mindful at home as well. So parents will become mindful later. <laughs> uh, we can have one last question. Uh, yes. Yeah, I am Dr. Jean Gay. Uh, my question is uh, on the findings of the research. Uh, we noted that uh, you have found two types of relationships, relationships at home and relationships with peers. And you said that students attending the Satipasala, they have better relationships with the family members, but their relationships with the peers have not improved. What reasons can you suggest for that? Um, the exact reason, of course, uh, the uh, as for the study findings, we, we have not gone deep into the psychological aspect of this result. So uh, as for the study findings, I don't think I have a good explanation. But uh, maybe from a psychological point of a view, uh, the relationship with peers, uh, to establish a relationship with peers, it might you know, take a little longer. Uh, whereas uh, these children are uh, associating with their parents, you know, from the birth. So they have a, you know, the, to elicit a change in that relationship, maybe, I don't think I'm like 100% correct in this because I don't have a, you know, a very good explanation as such for this, uh, which has been, you know, proven scientifically. Maybe the psychiatrists in the audience would have a better explanation than me in this regard. Uh, my only explanation as for the study findings, maybe it takes a little longer to uh, make any, any change in the relationship with peers. That is the only explanation that I have. Okay, I'm mindful of the time. I have only a few more seconds to finish this session. And uh, we had a very interesting uh, array of presentations uh, which raised a lot of questions obviously uh, which needs attention and it was very interesting to see how uh, uh, Dr. Chandrika Jatilaka's explanation how they experimented it in uh, a different setting uh, Maria's observation was very sharp that uh, we had more Sri Lankan type uh, expats uh, living there but the interesting, uh, interesting point you highlighted was how they are trying to make it structured so that it can be multiplied effectively. And uh, uh, Venerable uh, Vajira's uh, case study was also an important aspect where she highlighted that the importance of starting from basics, uh, that is bringing in the moral aspect to this uh, uh, skill of mindfulness. I think increasingly the, uh, this aspect is being also discussed in various fora. Then uh, we had the privilege of uh, uh, li listening to uh, uh, a very interesting uh, research which you discussed a while ago with a few questions and of course the experiment and the challenges in the university and uh, we thank uh, the uh, thank Mr. Muthaya Doresami for bringing us to the four the challenges in the plantation sector because uh, as you said in your speech the whole country sees the plantation sector as an economic entity but there's a major human uh, challenge that is going on and uh, may I suggest among you there may be many practitioners please be a volunteer and uh, I suggest you give your consent to the organizers to spend time uh, sharing this with the Satipasala movement. And with that, I conclude this session. Thank you.
Thank you, Deepal, and that was an excellent suggestion. I think it can transcend to other sectors as well. Uh, I think Sri Lanka specifically needs mindfulness badly at this point of time, given that we're also going through various emotional changes uh, as in the aftermath of a war. We've not had, uh, how we would say, reconciliation in, in the holistic sense. So, and like uh, Professor Aluka said, um, there's a lot of pressure on young children, even grade five scholarship children, who are sometimes sent out from the house because of their uh, inability to pass exams. Uh, so there is a lot to be done. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are that way inclined to share your mindfulness, please do so, even with your next door neighbor, it'll help. Um, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Lakmal Nandasri to please come up on stage and present some tokens of appreciation to our guest speaker, our moderator, and our panelists. Firstly, to Mr. Muttaya Dure Swami. Thank you so much for making your way here, sharing your thoughts uh, of the minister with us. To Dr. Chandrika Jayatilaka. Dr. Yasasvi Valpita. Professor Alok Patirana. And finally, to our moderator, Mr. Deepal Suryarachi. Thank you very much, each and every one of you.